Welcome back. I'm joined by the author and associates of The Spectator, Douglas Murray. Well, Douglas, you've been waiting patiently over there in Israel. Uh, what did you make of that extraordinary interview? Um, well, I mean, um, listening to Jeremy Corbyn, uh, let alone Len, uh, talking about the Middle East and the way to solve the Middle East's problems is like watching somebody trying to do brain surgery whilst wearing boxing gloves. I mean, it is so cack-handed, it's just beyond belief. Uh, I, nobody in this region could make any sense of their dreams and claims and assertions. It, 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 everything that they said falls apart on first analysis. And the most extraordinary thing to me was Jeremy Corbyn's resolute refusal to answer two simple questions. Should Hamas stay in power mm. and are they a terror group? He wouldn't do it. I mean, Len McCluskey answered <laughs> both, but Corbyn was paralysed. He, he could not answer I know, those two it's... basic questions. But I'm afraid, as you know, uh, Piers, that's a character career trait of Jeremy Corbyn's. It was just the same with Sinn Féin IRA. Uh, he always seems to keep the door open to terror groups, whether they are anti-British terror groups like the IRA or anti-Israel groups like Hamas. I don't know why he feels this need. He's never been involved in any international peace negotiations anywhere, certainly never anywhere with any success, never anywhere with any prominence even. So it's always bizarre to hear him talking as if he's sort of been the UN Secretary General for the last 50 mm. years. And quite scary to think he was nearly potentially Prime Minister of his country. I mean, it does beg the question, if this had happened yes. to us, what would his reaction have been? If he's not able to say that Hamas, after oh. what they did on October the 7th, are a terrorist organisation, what would have happened if a terror organisation had killed 1,500 British people on our soil if he'd been running the country? Uh, absolutely. And, I, and I'd add to that. I mean, you know, he talks about the, the importance of clarity and, and being absolutely clear on things and is very unclear on things mm. himself. What he just said there about the Palestinians and Hamas and... I mean, they, he and Len McCluskey talk about Palestine, for instance. What do they mean by Palestine? Do they mean the West Bank? Do they mean the West Bank and Gaza? Do they mean the West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem? Like, what is this state? Do they mean everything in pre-1948 or post-1948? They never say. They just talk about this non-existent state that mm. still doesn't exist because for decade after decade, people like them have supported the worst possible elements and have encouraged them in this delusion that Israel can be disappeared. It's not going to be disappeared. Mm. And yet this delusion is encouraged, among other things, among some people in the Palestinian leadership, which is why when they're offered 99% of a state, as they have been time and time again, they say no, because 99% mm. isn't 100%. Well, that clip I found of Bill Clinton from a few years ago was very telling, both in his description of what Hamas do, which they're now doing, uh, and also in the fact that he had yeah. a, a great settlement there and Arafat yes. at the last minute screwed him, just walked away. Absolutely. Arafat walked away as, it, as his predecessors had walked away time and again. Uh, it, it could all be so different, you know. It could all be so different. Uh, just going back to what's happened in Gaza since the withdrawal, mm. you know, remember, the Israelis left Gaza in 2005. It was extremely traumatic for the people of Israel because they saw members of their own army pulling forcibly Jewish families from their homes because they said that they would give Gaza over to the Palestinians. There were elections. Hamas won the elections, killed their Fatah rivals, and then never had another election. Mm. How can anyone defend this group or believe they're a legitimate government of Palestine? Mm. Uh, the idea that they're any part... I tell you one thing, Piers, it's very, very obvious when you're here in the, in, in the period after the massacres mm. of October the 7th. It doesn't matter whether you're right wing or left wing. It doesn't matter whether you're a peacenik like many of the people who were murdered in the kibbutz or um, a, a supporter of Benjamin Netanyahu. Nobody in Israel believes that they can live beside Hamas. Mm. Nobody. No. Well, why would you? I mean, Hamas are dedicated in their charter to the eradication of Israel and they've proven on October the 7th they will kill as many Jewish people as they can get their hands on. And the Hamas spokesman only last week said they want to do what happened on October the 7th again and again and again. You can't do peace with people with that mentality. I, I, was, I, was, I was at one of the trauma hospitals earlier speaking to some survivors uh, of the, uh, the October attacks. 
I was very struck particularly by one man in his, I suppose, 40s, 50s. Um, mm. He and his family hid in their safe room, but they didn't lock safe rooms they couldn't lock because they were for bombs, not for Hamas terrorists coming door to door. Um, his daughter managed to survive. He lost both his legs. Um, he lost his wife, died in front of uh, him and his daughter, and he lost his 14-year-old son. Mm. And after this man described what happened when his boy breathed his last, um, he said, look, I'm a leftist. I've always been a leftist. Douglas, just hold, hold, I cannot Douglas, live hold your beside thought. These people. We're just going to come off there on the show, but we're going to carry on this for our YouTube. So one second, just stay with me. Uh, keep it uncensored. We're going to keep with Douglas Murray. We're going to be live on our YouTube channel now. Keep following. I'll come back to Douglas. So just finish that anecdote. You met this guy and he was on the left, you said. Yes, I mean, you hear that all the time. One of the things that I think many people outside Israel haven't realized is that many of the kibbutz, the, 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 the places where people were living, the villages and towns neighboring Gaza, were, were filled with left-wing peacenik types. Mm. The sort of people, for instance, who um, there was a woman in one kibbutz who um, every, you know, every day she drove Palestinian children to hospitals. Um, there were people who made sure they always had uh, Palestinian colleagues from Gaza. Uh, they would employ them. Uh, there, even the peace uh, rave near the borders of Gaza, you know, was significantly populated by people who sort of had, had the peace uh, uh, gig. I mean, that, that was their belief. That was their view, that they wanted to live in peace with their Palestinian neighbours. Mm. I think that one thing that people outside Israel really haven't understood is that it is these people who were disproportionately murdered in their homes on October the 7th. Mm. You know, you can see it literally on, their, on the signs they have on their fridges and their fridge doors in what remains of their houses. Um, you know, peace signs, uh, um, calls for peace. Um, I think that this is so important to realize. And one other thing, many of the uh, Hamas fighters, terrorists, who were, who were found dead or, f or captured alive uh, after that day, were found to have plans on them which had extraordinarily detailed uh, um, issues about who lived in which house. There are stories of there's one kibbutz where the, the man who was in charge of security in the kibbutz, the, the terrorists went to his house first and killed him and his family and then went door to door elsewhere. How did they have all of this knowledge, literally family by family, door to door? It was because some of the people they had given their trust to had sold them out, had given information over to Hamas to get them killed. Now, that is going to have, in Israel, a seismic effect in the years ahead. Mm. Anyone who thinks that what we heard from Jeremy Corbyn and Len McCluskey is remotely possible mm. is living in a different century to the one we're now in. Yeah, I just don't think there's a cat in hell's chance of Israel even countenancing doing any kind of peace deal with Hamas because Hamas are wedded to no. violence and the eradication of Israel and the Jewish people. I mean, they've made it blatantly clear. It's not something they hide. They've always made it blatantly clear. They've always made it clear in their actions. Uh, you know, and, and we just all have to take this seriously ourselves. You know, uh, uh, Israel takes it seriously. Some people, maybe some people like the peaceniks I just described, didn't think they really meant it and, mm. and, and learned, you know, in the worst way possible that they did. But we have Hamas people in the UK, we have Hamas leaders in the UK, we've given sanctuary to. We should all re also realise these people mean it, Piers. Mm. You know, and that if they had the upper hand, if they had their way in the UK, they wouldn't hesitate to do the same thing that their friends did in Israel last month. Yeah, it's so true. Douglas Murray, thank you very much indeed for hanging on there. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Have a good night. Thank you.